Greetings, Matt Sanders here. I've had the privilege of serving in the role of chaplain for about 30 years. I just hit my 60th birthday. And the older I get, the more and more my own spirituality needs to reflect, needs to reflect on this message right here. Let God love you. I've recently finished this book and I want to share with you the contents chapter by chapter over the course of this series. Now for this video, the first video in the series, I want to give you a basic overview of what the curriculum of this series. And I want to go through actually the table of contents so you know all the bits and pieces that I want to cover and then share with you the contents of chapter one. So reading from the back cover of the book, it gives a summary of what the whole point and uh, emphasis is. This book contains essays and prayers to nurture a childlike trust in God's great love for you. A childlike trust. Life can bring great joys and tremendous hardships, times of success and moments of failure. These short essays and prayers help to shine a light on the human condition with its whole spectrum of highs and lows and to nurture the courage to trust, to trust. Through it all, God Almighty loves you. These pages contain some theology, philosophy, psychology, and storytelling, but mostly this is a book of spirituality and prayer to help you to be more like a little child and throw yourself into the unfailing arms of the humble and the glorious Christ Jesus, the lover of our souls. Additionally, there is a special section of personal conversion stories, each unique, but each also showing the transformative power of God's love. And one of the conversion stories is of John Michael Talbot, that tremendous musician gave me permission to share his story in this book. So let's take a quick look at the table of contents so you can get a sense of what is covered in this curriculum. In section one, I talk about the theme. It's the, the whole section is on the theme of do you dare let God love you? It might take some courage. It might take some rugged trust to return to this belief, this truth that God loves you. And do you dare? Because it can be an, an intense experience. If God grants it, if he pours out his love to you, whoa, it can be very, very powerful. I will talk about in chapter one, which I will cover today, a messenger visits in a dream. And then I'll share in chapter 2 a litany of thanksgiving for God's love. In chapter 3, a little prayer, like a flower. Chapter 4, talk about receiving love, receiving the love of God Almighty, sometimes requires humility. Humility. In section two, I'll talk about the human condition. The human condition. I call this a primer on the human condition. It's very helpful to understand these aspects and dimensions of our struggle as humans that is common across cultures, ages, religions, and so forth, that we, that, that we all, probably most of us, struggle with some key things and it helps when we turn to when we go to our prayer life it helps to know that these things are going to arise these dimensions of the human condition and then to saturate our whole life as best we can with the love of God now by that I mean we can't create the love of God, but by opening our hearts so that we give, God, we give consent to God that he would saturate our whole lives with his grace, his mercy, 
and his love. So in chapter 5, I will talk about the, the human person is a tripart being of body, our psychological self, and the soul or the spirit. Chapter 2, I will talk about pain is inevitable, but misery is optional. It's, it's really pretty true. Chapter 7, I'll talk about insecurity and inferiority, fear and shame. It is powerful to understand and be able to recognize when fear and shame arise. And when we are spending time in our contemplative prayer, our prayer time, to recognize that, that insecurity and inferiority, those memories, they will arise and just let them be there. Don't hold on tightly to them and open up our hearts and allow ourselves to be saturated by the love, mercy, and the tender care of God Almighty right in the midst of our experience of fear and shame. Chapter 8, I will talk about instinctual programs for happiness. What are those? The desire for power and control, the desire for affection and esteem, the desire for safety and security, the tendency to practice experiential avoidance in a way that isn't helpful and doesn't work in the long run, and the desire to run after immediate gratification. In chapter 9, I will talk about the capital sins. Paggles, you can, you can use that to help remember the, quote, seven deadly sins, pride, anger, greed, gluttony, lust, envy, sloth. That's part of the human condition that we struggle. We have to face the fact that we struggle with temptation to sin. Chapter 10, I want to talk about three of the struggles that is mentioned in the long tradition of the church and specifically in scripture that we have to battle against the world, the flesh, and the devil. That's, a, I think, a very helpful chapter. I think these are all helpful, but that one provides some very good education, I believe. Chapter 11, talking, I will talk about proper quote, treatment, or how do we address the struggles that we face, depending on whether it's coming from the world, the flesh, or the devil, or fear, or, uh, or in sh fear, or shame, insecurity, or inferiority. How do we assess where these struggles are coming from, and what helps? And again, over and over and over, I'm going to talk about, <laughs> let the Almighty love you through it all. Uh, section three, I will address various topics, miscellaneous topics, just ones that arose in my mind as I was writing the book. So chapter 12, I'll talk about scriptural pictures of God's love for us. For example, Christ's words from the cross, Jesus restores Peter, and so forth. Chapter 13, the topic is love of God deficiency. I think that it's common that we have a deficiency in experiencing the love of God for ourselves. And just shine a light on that as we continue to open up our hearts to simply receive this gift of the love, compassion, mercy, and forgiveness of God Almighty. Chapter 14, I'll talk about the tendency that some may have to overtalk, overtalking, and not to bring it up in order to shame, you know, someone that may have that tendency, but allow that to be healed little by little by the love of God. Chapter 15, I'll talk about opening up our hearts to the love of God amidst the experience of depression or even suicidal thoughts. Those are tremendously difficult experiences that one may have to go, may go through depression or having suicidal thoughts, hopelessness. We'll explore that 
in the context of being receptive to the love of God for us if when life is really, really hard. Chapter 16. God's love heals when we've made mistakes and errors. If you have regrets for something you have done in the past or something that you failed to do that you felt like you should have done, allowing ourselves to be healed by the love of God. When we've made mistakes and errors. Chapter 17, I want to talk about loneliness and your vocation. Your vocation, your calling. And sometimes it calls us into a desert of loneliness, but we're never alone. Chapter 18, resting in God's love when we're exhausted or ill. Chapter 19, explore the topic of healing our relationship with our parents if our parents had mental illness or substance abuse problems. Chapter 20, embrace the mess. Life is messy, is difficult. Talk about embracing that instead of running from it. Chapter 21, body image, accepting ourselves, our bodies as they are, Recall, remembering God Almighty loves us regardless what we look like. Chapter 22. I want to address a counterpoint, like sort of like an argument against this. Does all this talk of God's lavish love potentially lead to moral laxity? Does all this talk of God's lavish <clears throat> love for us <clears throat> Does that potentially lead to moral laxity? I want to address that, um, that argument. <clears throat> Chapter 23, God's love heals a broken heart. Have you had, ever had a broken heart? Are you experiencing that now? Talk about receiving. So in this chapter, I want to encourage the reader, the listener, to have a tender heart to receive the love of God amidst the wrenching experience of having a broken heart, of unrequited love, that kind of thing. Chapter 24, love overflows into forgiveness. The importance of forgiveness, the power of forgiveness, the, the healing that comes to our lives when we forgive another who has wronged us. Chapter 25, speak of how the importance that love that we receive from the Almighty fills our hearts and overflows and we share that with others through service. So love overflows into service. So that will end uh, section three, moving into section four. This is, I consider this a very important section and it's a short section. Cultivating a contemplative prayer practice. Moments, 20 minutes of day, 20 minutes a day, sitting in silence, disposing our hearts, opening our hearts as best we can to say yes to God's presence, action, and love within. It's really simple. In fact, if you get nothing else from this whole topic, I would hope that you just get this to trust that God Almighty loves you and then by way of a practice spend 20 minutes a day in silence and remind yourself of this message of God's love for yourself and simply say yes to God's presence, action, and love within. Very simple prayer practice. Section 5, I will, oh, this is a very special section as well. I have the privilege of sharing four different conversion stories, ex experiences of people who have felt and were transformed by the love of God. The first one is Mickey Rooney. I found a, an account of him telling, he's a, uh, one of the actors of the golden age of Hollywood, uh, where he had the experience of the love of God that transformed him. And as I mentioned earlier, 
John Michael Talbot has given me permission to share his uh, conversion story, which is uh, uploaded here on YouTube. And I, um, I transcribed it with his permission, and it's a beautiful story. I share also in chapter 29 the uh, conversion story of Sister Emmanuel Maillard. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing her last name right. She's a French nun living in Medjugorje. And her conversion, conversion story is very powerful and engaging. Also, her story is found on YouTube. And then in chapter 30, the last of the conversion stories, it's from an acquaintance of mine by the name of Steve Patton, who also his story is, is absolutely, is centrally about the love of God that he experienced for himself and how that changed everything. So those are four personal stories of, of conversion, of a turning, of life transformation that encourages encourages us to open up our hearts and just receive the love of God. Chapter uh, 31, there's 31 chapters in the book, is conclusion in which we simply take a moment and marvel at God's tremendous love for us. <clears throat> there are five addenda to this to the book. Uh, the first one is a quick summary for life. That's what I call it. Uh, the second addenda is love in six directions. Uh, addenda three, the gospel message in a nutshell. Section uh, addenda four, something I call the serenity prayer method, the serenity prayer method. And chapter uh, addenda five, a summary of prayer categories that we can remember by the acronym PATRICKS. So that is an overview of where we are going. Let us launch right into chapter one. Section one asks, do you dare let God love you? Do you dare let God love you? And I want to share with you a dream that I had. Again, this is chapter one. I'm just going to read straight from the text here. This whole book was um, sort of launched out of a discussion that I had with a friend of mine. I was speaking with um, a colleague who's a chaplain and also happens to be uh, trained in psychology. And he was a, he's a very good listener. And I just happened to mention in somewhat passing of this powerful dream that I had. And he says, what? What was that dream? And so I shared that dream that I had about 15 years ago, 15 or maybe close to 20 years ago. And by retelling the dream, which I'm going to tell you in a moment, by retelling the dream, it, it was fresh in my mind, fresh in my heart, and was so powerful to relive it, to remember it, that I recognize this is a message that I really need to hear for myself. It turned into this little book, this little curriculum that I'm sharing with you now. So a messenger visits in a dream. One night I had a dream. It had been a sad and heartbreaking day and I fell asleep with a heavy heart. In this dream, I was in my house. I heard a knock on the door. As I answered, I was greeted by my late father, Mark. My late father, Mark, and his friend by the name of Carl Henning. Even in my dream, somehow, I remembered that my father had died several years earlier. I blurted out, Dad, how are you here? You're dead. He just looked at me silently with his cool, unflappable eyes. I asked, can you come in and visit? He said, yes. I was delighted, I was so happy, and asked, can I get you something to drink? Yes, he said, and sat down at my dining room table with his friend, Carl. I continued, 
Do you want something to eat? In his stereotypical fashion, he was rather short and direct and said, no, just a drink. We won't be staying long. So we all sat at the table. I don't recall any other conversation with my father or any words at all from his friend. I would later understand that my father's visit seemed to have been a quiet show of support to me amidst my heartache and also a prelude to the main part of the dream which would soon follow. After a few moments, my attention was directed to my bedroom. I got up from the table and didn't have any more interaction with my father or his friend. I walked down the hallway and turned to the doorway of my bedroom. It was there that I was met by a rather strange character. This character was about my height, about my build. He was wearing a kind of plaid shirt and had a kind of scruffy look about him. He was mysterious in an odd way, but not an unsafe way. He appeared safe, but odd. I was startled at seeing this being standing there. Then he spoke. I have a message for you from God. A message from God? What? I stood expectantly, waiting for him to deliver this important message. But he stood in silence. I was impatient. Well, what's the message? He said abruptly. Oh, no, no. No, 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 no. I can't just come out and tell you. It's too powerful. I'll have to tell you the message backwards. <laughs> I was annoyed. Backwards? Why? That seems silly. Ah. <sighs> Okay, go ahead, tell it to me backwards. He then spoke a phrase that sounded like mere gibberish, and I just couldn't make it out. So I pleaded with this quirky character, look, I can't figure it out, just tell me plainly. The messenger said, okay, but I warned you, it's powerful. So I braced myself, the messenger then proclaimed God's message to me. Rest in peace, my love. Be still your heart in me. Rest in peace, my love. Be still your heart in me. I stood there quietly and reflectively, pondering this odd message. A moment or two later, the dream ended and I woke. It took a minute for the cobwebs in my mind to clear. Then the dream, my father's visit, that scruffy messenger, and the message itself came to me with full impact. The message hit me with a great force of emotion. I actually burst into tears with an explosion of weeping. Many minutes passed I kept repeating that phrase over in my mind. Rest in peace, my love. Be still your heart in me. Rest in peace, my love. Be still your heart in me. What a strange message. Rest in peace is what we say for the dead. I would come to understand in part that something deep and wise within was calling me to die to the old so something new could arise. And the next line, my love, rest in peace, my love was impressed upon my consciousness. Is it possible God Almighty addresses me with such a beloved term of endearment? God calls me his love? How can a mere creature handle the powerful affection of the one who is love? That's why the message was so powerful, as that messenger had warned. The messenger had playfully said he was going to say the phrase backward, 
so I could slowly work my way into the impact and the force of the statement. Is it possible that the very creator of the universe refers to me, this weak and pathetic creature, as my love? And the last line, be still your heart in me. Rest in peace, my love, be still your heart in me. First of all, that's an odd, old-fashioned word, be still, B-E-S-T-I-L-L, -L, one word, be still. I don't think I ever used it prior to this, yet here it was in this dream as a gentle invitation and a gentle command to rest, to be still in the loving presence of the Almighty. This dream really opened me up to a deeper sense of God's love for me. God calls me my love. And now in return, I sometimes call God my love and my life. And God calls you his love. He loves you. He loves the sound of your voice. He loves the way you walk about the earth. He loves your uniqueness. And his love is what brings the great healing, the great healing for the wounds. That concludes chapter one. We'll continue next time with chapter two.